a couple things that I'll sort of whet your appetite with in terms of, um, and then I'll go for some questions, in terms of some simple things you can do. When you're in the hospital and, and you have surgery, or maybe not even surgery, often you will have a catheter. They call it a Foley catheter. If after surgery you can't get out of bed, it's too painful, they put a catheter in. Well, we know that if a catheter stays in, it's incremental over time. So for every day that a catheter is in, you increase your chances of getting a urinary tract infection. And that is so important uh, you know, for people to understand that it's a given. Okay, so after 10 days, you got a really good chance you might get a urinary tract infection. So what do you think the single most important reason why people have these catheters in too long? You, you, don't, you don't know the answer, so don't. <laughs> Anybody? Well, we know that the single most important reason why these catheters um, are staying in is because the doc didn't write on the notes to take the catheter out. Simple as that, no one, because he has to write the orders on the, on, the, on, the, on the chart. So what do you need to do? That's where the advocate comes in, because after surgery, you, you know, you're not thinking of this. So every day when they come in, the nurse, when someone's making rounds, ask the simple question, do I still need the catheter? Can you ask the doctor to remove it if I don't need it? Real simple thing you can do. If your loved one or someone is in the intensive care unit and they're on a respirator, something that's breathing for them, we know a simple thing like making the head of the bed at a 30 degree angle, okay, can decrease your chance, chance of getting pneumonia. Again, very simple. Companies have even come out with little strips that you can put on the back of the wall or you can go, you can go in and look at this and ask, you know, is there a reason the bed isn't up 30 degrees? Simple things you can do. These are not rocket science. You know, we're not asking you to go in the operating room and make sure, you know, that your right blood is there. These are very simple things you can do. Bathing. You know, this may sound funny, but, you know, studies have been shown that hospitals, it's like do it yourself in terms of bathing. You know, it's not like it was years ago or over in European countries where they encourage, like in, in Japan, they encourage the family to come in and bring their own supplies and wash, you know, the patient. Uh, in the U.S., it's often the last thing on the line that's being done with patients. And we know, in particular, um, we've done a couple studies, that if patients are bathed every day, and in particular if you use wipes that have chlorhexidine in it, okay, and this doesn't apply to the pediatric type because of the problems there, but with adult populations, if they are bathed every day, one particular hospital that we worked with decreased their resistant organisms with methicillin resistant staph by over 90 percent. A simple thing like bathing. I mean, the other thing too, you got to make sure if you're in a hospital and come, someone comes with you with a basin of water, you got to run, okay? <laughs> because they cause problems. A basin of water with a towel is not the way you should be bathing patients in the hospital. It's been shown that those basins, if you culture them, it's like a microbiology book. Okay. So it's very important that a person in the hospital gets washed every day. And this particular hospital out in California that we work with, they have what they call bathing rounds. And the infection control person went around every day and asked the patient, not the nurse, asked the patient, did someone bathe you today? And if they didn't, he called someone immediately to have it done. And they were the hospital that decreased their resistant organisms. Important fact. Um, <clears throat> schools. You know, schools are really trying to do a good job. And, and it's, you know, I never thought we'd see the day where sanitizers and would be in schools and um, would help decrease the spread of infections. So schools are trying to do a good job. And this is something, you know, as parents or grandparents, you know, you should be aware of that, you know, kids need to wash their hands. And they're being taught this as part of their health class. And actually, it's interesting, over in Europe, when they first started doing this, um, they basically decided that, well, do we need to put soap in every, all the rooms? And what European, a couple of European schools studied was just using a paper towel. If you can't get access to water or soap, if you get a paper towel and just rub your hands like this, it's just as good as using the other thing because the way you, you get rid of bacteria is you have to break the cell wall, the bacteria, and it's done by friction. So rubbing your hands on a paper towel is gonna work just as well. 
Uh, and of course, people say, well, in Europe, the paper towels are like sandpaper, and, and I must agree. But it's, it's the friction that will work. Um, daycare centers. You know, you've got to be aware of infectious problems that ha happen in daycare centers. Um, the driving force for me to stay home with our two kids was while I was pregnant, I had a grant to look at seven daycare centers in the Philadelphia area and out where we lived. And that was the deciding point that I came home and said to my husband, I think I need to stay home for a while. It was just amazing what I saw. You know, we would go in the daycare centers. And what was more amazing to me is how much people were paying for this. Okay, they go into the daycare centers. And if we went in the morning at drop off, and we went at the end to collect our data. We were looking to, to develop an infection control plan for daycare centers to prevent the spread of infections. We went in the morning, we went at night. Everything just seemed really great, and I was very positive. We went during the day. It was like something in a third world country. I mean, you know, cribs were not in, in compliance with being so many feet apart. The, health, the uh, aides were putting the babies in this way over the crib because they can, couldn't get in between. And the monumental problems in the utility room where they prepared the food, they were also doing changes of diapers. And, and you know, so there's things that you've got. Now, there are good daycare centers. You know, I'm not up here saying there aren't. But you need to be aware of these things when you or, or your children are looking at daycare ki uh, kids centers for their kids. The workplace. Did you know that 60% of workers in the U.S. go to work sick? Okay, so you've got, you know, a bunch of people in a closed environment sharing things like computers, faucets, elevators. And I'm not germ phobic, but look, if 60% of people are working together and they go to work sick, especially during the flu season, you know, you've got to be more vigilant about hand hygiene. And some people just can't stay home and because of many reasons, financial or because they're afraid to lose their job. So you've got to be proactive in the workplace. Uh, <clears throat> there, there's been numerous studies that have shown transmission of bacteria uh, in the workplace. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what else can I cover here? And then we'll open it up to some questions. Um, I will pass this around because people always ask, you know, questions like, how should you wash your hands? or when should you wash them? The World Health Organization came out with guidelines. There are basically five moments when you're in that bed in the hospital. So after we break, you can look at this. There are five moments when you need to make sure that your healthcare worker washed their hands. Okay, um, before touching a patient, makes a lot of sense. Before cleaning or doing an aseptic procedure like inserting a line, um, after, uh, <clears throat> After, you know, looking at body fluid, like the Foley catheter, okay, after touching the patient and any, touching any environmental service, uh, surfaces, like the red bail, uh, uh, like the bed rail. You got to keep in mind that the golden rule is hand washing occurs before and after patient contact, okay? So here's the scenario. Not, a healthcare worker comes in, goes over the wall, grabs the gloves and puts them on. No, no, that doesn't work. Okay, you've got, they've got to wash their hands. Okay, so you ask them, could you please wash your hands? Okay, they're going to give you a dirty look. I'm, I'm, it's reality. Okay, and they'll say, I did it down the hall. No, that doesn't count because you've touched a lot of things along the way. They've, you've got to do it right there. Put the gloves on. Do whatever you're going to do. Don't put the gloves on and say, oh, I forgot something, and then go out to that computer. Remember that computer that has all the bacteria on it? Okay, so it's got to be before, you know, wash your hands, go in, talk to the patient, okay? Put the gloves on if you're gonna do a procedure. When you're done, take the gloves off, throw them away, and wash your hands. Why? Bacteria multiply every 20 minutes. It's hot in those gloves. So you've got bacteria on your hand, just naturally, because we all have bacteria on our hands, even if we wash them, okay? There's a certain number of bacteria that stay. So they're multiplying. You need to wash those before you touch that door to go out the room. So the golden rule, before and after patient contact. And there's another diagram here in case you're in a doc's office or in a chair. That's why the person's sitting there. And then how to wash your hands. There's a diagram here on how to wash them and how to use a hand rub. 
you know, the sanitizers, the one that doesn't use water, the one that uses water. So has anyone ever been in, the, in an airport where they're playing happy birthday or row, row, row your boat? No? No. Well, there are several airports in the U.S. that have that song being played. The problem is, again, we haven't gotten the message across to the consumer. There's, you're supposed to be able to, hand washing should take you two verses of happy birthday or two verses of row, row, row your boat. Okay, so particularly in Atlantic, Atlanta Airport, and of course that's where CDC is, they've got this music playing, and I can remember a few times being in there and listening and saying, wow, that's really cool, they've got it, you know, like, and the woman next to me said, why do they keep playing that stupid song? Okay, so we need to get the message across on why we're doing this. Um, okay, I think I covered the highlights, and I, I'll open it up to some questions. Well, the only other thing, I, I guess, is uh, resistant organisms, like MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Uh, and there are others coming down the line. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you're all familiar with what they call the superbugs and, and resistant bacteria. It's a real problem. You know, for MRSA, we, we still have some antibiotics that you can use to treat uh, patients with this, but on some of them, others, they're becoming highly resistant. And I've got to leave you with this message. The single most important way to prevent transmission of MRSA is hand hygiene, like all of these infections. You know, we, we have a lot of companies making a lot of money on different things to wash the bed railings, to change the drapes between patients. You've got to realize that the underlying problem is if people wash their hands, we won't be contaminating all these things. So companies are getting very rich on all these new technologies, and there's loads of things coming down the road. We call them widgets, where healthcare workers can wear a badge, and it has a little green light, a little red light when they come into your room. And you as a patient are supposed to say, okay, here's the red light, and when they wash their hands, the red light turns green. Okay, there's a lot of steps in there that you've got to teach this patient to know about that, and, and you know, are they capturing everything? So, you know, resistant organisms are a problem in a hospital, but they're also a problem in the community. So, and the problem with resistant organisms is that when patients come into the hospital, hospitals should have some policy in place which patients they're going to culture when they come into the hospital so that if they are carriers or colonized, meaning they have this bacteria on them, um, we can put them in a separate location, or if they're going to have a clean procedure like a knee replacement or bypass surgery, you can treat them before you do the surgery, and it's a simple, you know, treatment. So you need to make yourself aware of these things. In our book, that you know, I, I always feel like I'm a salesperson, but in the back of the book, uh, the eight simple things we've put on a little card that you can cut out, laminate and carry around like you carry your Medicare and your Blue Cross card so that when you go in the hospital, you can look at this and say, okay, you know, Dr. McGuckin's solution, I have to have an advocate. Is my advocate here? Informed consent, you got to be those six things. Surgery, hopefully you will have asked that question before you're in the bed, you know, if you can. <laughs> Uh, I got a catheter in. I got to remember about that. So we go through each of the things. If I ever was told I had an MRSA infection, I got to make sure my doc knows this. Okay? So, you know, and as I said before, we need to model some of what we do af after what they do uh, with little kids, neonates. You know, if you, you don't dare go into a room where a parent's there. Uh, with a small little two, three pound baby and not wash your hands because the parents will tell you. Okay, so we need to train, you know, our adults to do a better job. So I will open this up to some questions. We have about 10 minutes and, you know, hopefully you'll have some questions or some, yeah. But yes, the rule applies to um, medical technologists, you know, when they come in, and, and I know I experienced that recently, and I said, take the gloves off and wash your hands. You know what, I, I would be wrong to say that, you know, they're going to look at me and say, oh, that's really nice, thank you for reminding me. No, they're not going to. But you're the one that will have the infection, and you're the one that could be hooked up six weeks to IV antibiotics. So the answer to your question is, if you're getting blood drawn, it's the same rule. Wash your hands, put on the gloves, 
take the blood, take them off, wash your hands. It's before and after. You go down to radiology, you know, it's across the hospital. It's not just, you know, in your little patient area. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, it's, it's just crazy that we're using this in our homes. I mean, remember what I said before, a rough paper towel work, you know, so now you have antimicrobial all over. Kids have it in their backpack. They buy it from Bath and Body. You know, it's not necessary, you know, to have an antimicrobial, and, and it could add to our resistance of these organisms. So we need to teach the kids, you know, the proper way of doing it, you know, the hand washing, of rubbing. You know, that's more important than a little vial of antimicrobial. So, yes. Well, MRSA, you know, the, the question is MRSA and C. diff. For MRSA, yes, you know, there are antibiotics that work. Um, you know, it, it just can be a long time. It depends. You know, a lot of the community acquired MRSAs are skin type, you know, infections. You hear with basketball teams and, and things like that. A lot in the hospital, you can certainly get sepsis through your blood. You can get pneumonia. And yes, there are treatments. We do have some antibiotics for that. C. difficile is, is the other problem. <clears throat> um, the way you get C. difficile is um, often overuse of antibiotics, and it selects out your bacteria, and the C. difficile, you know, is a bacteria that has toxins, and it can do a lot of damage to your intestines. Uh, <clears throat> the, the problem with C. difficile is identifying patients who have it and appropriately identifying them. Some of them need treatment, some of them don't. But yes, there is treatment for it. And it's just a matter of correctly identify those patients that have it. I actually had a call from a friend the other day, and um, she said to me, did I know someone who was, you know, into holistic medicine? <laughs> like, you know, I thought, well, I didn't give an impression that I'm so anti-doc, you know, and I said, no, I, I really don't. She said, well, she says, you know, I have this gut problem, and and, you know, I have GI problems and I have symptoms and I, I just don't want to take any more medicine and, you know, it's really terrible and, and all this. So I said to her, were you in the hospital recently? Yes, I was in the hospital in January. Were you in, on antibiotics? Yes, I was on antibiotics. I said, when you went to the doc, did he ask to do a culture? And she said, what do you mean? I, I said, like, take a stool specimen and, and do a culture? And she said, no, what was he looking for? And I said, C. difficile. Now, this person is a highly educated person. You know my theory, the more educated you are, the more money. Uh, is, is a leader in, 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 a, in a company, had no idea about C. difficile. You know, and I said, you, need, you don't need a holistic person. You need to go back to your doctor or go into a minute clinic know, at CVS, and they will do a test for C. difficile, you know, take a specimen and, and do this. So, you know, we need to be more proactive in educating people, and especially in the hospital, you know, if a person, if you don't know a person has uh, C. difficile, and they're in a room with someone else, and they have loose bowels or something like that, you know, you're not into the best, you know, precautions for this, and you can see how it can go from patient to patient. You know, there, there's no question about that. You know, I recently was on, uh, sometimes I get called to uh, be an expert wis witness on cases uh, that involve hospital acquired infection, and it was a C. difficile, and it was a young woman who, uh, they totally missed this, who was pregnant and was having a baby, and, you know, she had a fever, and she had temperature, and, and then she had some diarrhea, and nobody understood what was going on, and the long and the short <laughs> was she had these explosive diarrheas and it was on the OB floor. Nobody knew, this was after she delivered the baby, nobody knew what was going on, but they said, well, maybe we should take a culture. So they send the culture for C. difficile, and, but then they send her home. And then the irony of the whole thing, so you can see medical errors that happen in hospitals. The, pa the, the woman goes home and she's still sick. She's given them the specimen, they send it to the lab. Now this lab test now that we can do you know, for the toxins can take somewhere between two and four hours, even, even less than that. Okay, they could have said to her, could you wait two hours? But no, no, we're just going to send you home. So when the culture came back and it was positive for C. difficile, it went to the ward secretary who looks at it and says, oh, this patient went home. And just puts it in the chart, never tells anyone. 
So the long and the short is this woman, they couldn't get what was going on. She went to the different people and all that, and she finally had to have a good part of her um, intestines taken out, and she still ha she has a bag now because it's a problem with this. And she was like 28 years old. I mean, there's a real medical error. You know, the ward clerk is getting this information. Now, you know, it's unfortunate that the woman didn't know enough to say, well, she probably didn't know what they were taking a culture for. And, you know, often everybody's in a situation, I didn't get a report, so no news is good news and no one follows up, you know. And there are hospitals now that are, you know, I know at Penn, you know, they're, they're very good with their um, online, you know. And if my you, penis. my penis in medicine. And if you agree, uh, the labs in particular can go directly from the epicenter into your box, bypassing everything. And you know now we, in Pennsylvania, the law has been passed that you can call and get your lab results without getting your doc's per permission. Right. You know, so you don't have to wait and you know until it gets funneled through somewhere else. I don't have exact information on whether it's necessary. I mean, it's my understanding that that's the protocol that people follow. If someone has had a joint or a knee replacement, they should, uh, in fact, um, be on this. Or if they have mitral valve prolapse you know, of a certain degree, they need to be on the antibiotic before a dental procedure. I mean, something like that is a one-time thing. You know, we're not talking about prolonged. Yeah, maybe you can address that. No, that's an excellent point because, you know, they've done numerous studies where they actually uh, worked on dental students, <laughs> you know, swab their uh, gums with uh, the organism serratia, which is a red type, you know, bacteria, and then they took blood like 30 minutes after a procedure, and it was in their bloodstream. Now, fortunately, most of us can, you know, wipe this out and take care of it, but people who have a prosthetic device or something like that, you know, these bacteria want to trap to something that's foreign in your body, and that's foreign in your body. Okay. The more important thing, you know, in, in any type of surgical procedure, and in particular knees and hips, because, you know, if you look at all the lawsuits that are out there, they're the most common. Knees and hips, you know, joint replacements. People are suing because of that. And, um, you know, the, the most important thing is to remember that those procedures, you know, when you have an open wound, a wound, it takes 48 hours for that wound to close. So you've got to be pretty vigilant during that time period about hand washing healthcare workers and yourself, you know, there's personal hygiene too, you know, interventional personal hygiene we call it, you as a patient, you know, need to make sure you wash your hands too. You know, over in Europe when, when patients come into the hospital, they give them, especially in um, Geneva, they give their patients little vials of hand sanitizer in their little packet, you know, and they say, you know, you need to do this before you have your meal, after you go to the bathroom, you know, because I'm sure people don't, you know, educate the patients about this. Any other questions? Well, you know, it's when's interesting. Uh, when's our next study going to be? Uh, right, right now, we just finished a study where we are looking at, we asked, we did a telephone survey. So if you ever get a ter telephone survey on hand hygiene, we use this organization that randomly dials people, represents population in the US. And our, and our most recent one was, what do you think the hand hygiene compliance rate is among healthcare workers in the hospital? We, they had to pick a number, okay, not like, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. And we gave percentages. Well, it was really interesting because then we said, then we compared their answer to whether or not they would ask their healthcare worker to wash their hands. By and large, the majority, the highest number of compliance that, that the customer, the, consumer answered was zero to 25 percent. So you people know that people aren't doing it. And then when we asked them, you know, we correlated their answer with whether they ever asked, if they were in the hospital the last two years, were they ever, did they ever ask their healthcare worker to wash their hands, 90-something percent said they never did. So we've got a disconnect of consumer knows they're not doing it, but I don't want to ask my healthcare worker. And what we're finding and what we say to hospitals, one of the key things you have, hospitals need to do is you have to empower your healthcare worker to tell the patient it's okay to ask. 
because we find in our studies, if, if, a, if a nurse during the initial nursing assessment says, you know, we're expecting you to do this, we want you to do it, please do it, in those settings, patients will ask. It's like giving a child permission. You know, can I ride my bike? Yeah, you can ride it one block. You know, something like that. So we need to encourage our healthcare workers to make sure they empower their patients. Because if you define the word empowerment, it means giving people skills, okay, how to do it. I've told you tonight, you know, some of the things you need to do. Knowledge, I've given you some knowledge of why this is important. And it has to be in an accepting environment. And that's where the healthcare worker comes in. Yeah, Lucille? Yeah. yeah, in answer to your first question, you know, the rule is if your hands are visibly dirty, okay, then you must use soap and water. Okay, so if you're a healthcare worker and they're visibly dirty, you must use soap and water. Uh, if you, as a person, you know, you feel like they're visibly dirty, you're gonna wash them. If not, sanitizer is fine. But like in your home, you know, soap and water is easier to use. You know, I go to you know, sanitizers all over the place. I, I always feel compelled when people visit us. You know, I guess because I do this, I put sanitizers all over the place because I think they expect it. You know, <laughs> oh, well, oh, well, she has. Oh, I better use it. You know, I, I don't know. You know, uh, as far as environmental, <clears throat> environmental services and, and all those things that you're talking about now, which used to be called housekeeping, now it's environmental service. Um, you know, they play an important part because a place isn't is as clean as those people are, are going to be in. And in the, U, in the U.S., and, you know, it's a real problem. You know, I, I spent a good part of my life at Penn, and in the beginning actually did epidemiology and infection control in the hospital. And, you know, it's hard when you have unions <laughs> to really be real forceful. I'm being honest with you, you know. And, and you know, it seems like our bigger hospitals in the U.S., just seem to be dirtier than smaller hospitals. When I say dirtier, I mean visibly looking at it aesthetically. And you know, that's the single most important thing when people come from abroad to here. I spent a year in um, Oxford at JR Hospital. And when I arrived there, that's a 1,500 bed hospital. And I was like, 1,500 beds, this is like a city, you know? And it's interesting because I said to them, so where's your intensive care units? Units, you notice I said, because right now in the American hospital, we've got intensive cares for everything. And they said, oh, it's down on the lower level. And I said, well, well where's the other ones? Well, we only have one. And I went down and looked at it, and you know, I, I say this half-heartedly now, is it was next to the morgue, okay? So the whole idea was, like, if you're gonna be that you know, you're down there. And they did a lot of things on the floor that we would never think of doing. But then on the other side of the coin, environmental service in hand, it's like an honor to the people over there. And, and I also spent some time in Leuven in Belgium. And, you know, they pass those jobs down through the family, you know, to be housekeeper. And they pride themselves. And you know what? The hospitals are clean. I mean, you look at the floors, and I look, and, and I think, it's clean. Now, have there been studies to show that because a floor is dirty, you know, we're going to have more infections? No, but, you know, I guess the whole idea right now is happy patients. You know, I'm sure if you've been in the hospital, you've gotten a survey, patient satisfaction. We need to have happy patients. And you know why? Because if we don't have happy patients, that survey you fill out goes to a central place, and if they're outside the deviation, they get paid less from Medicare. So, you know, there's certain scores. So, so everybody wants happy patients, but we've got to have patients understand being happy in the hospital isn't because you get a discount on your parking and your meals are warm. And, you know, this, we, we've got to somehow introduce happy patients that our healthcare workers have washed their hands. You know, so that's my next uh, motive is, <laughs> or motion is to get people, you know, on board that way. Oh yeah, that's that's big. Yeah, well, you know, if we can, if we can get um, patients to go to these sites, it's there, you know. And then often, you know, when I give these lectures, well, people say, "Well, I don't have a computer." Well, you can call Ludington if you people live out there. You can call the Philadelphia Library. You can have them go onto this site. You can have them go onto the Pennsylvania site. 
And you can ask for that, so there's no reason. If you can't do that, okay, you can call the administrative office of a hospital or the medical staff of the office and say, I'm having, you know, hip surgery. I want to know the infection rate for this hospital for hip surgery. They're going to tell you, okay. If they're not going to tell you, then there's a problem. And the reason they want to tell you is that's part of their marketing. You know, Charles Einlander, who was head of the People's Medical Society uh, in, in this area years ago, said people know more about the tree that their coffin came from than they know about the hospital that they're going into. And his goal was to have, you know, like a billboard, a flashing light outside each hospital with their infection rates, you know, an overall infection rate. You know, it, it, we laugh, but... You know, I give these lectures and, you know, I, I really need to congratulate you people, you know, for coming because my husband always says, people don't want to hear about hospitals and people don't want to hear about what's going to happen to them, you know. But how come everybody I meet when I tell them what I do, they've all had an infection, and, you know, and I'm now at the point where I say, you know what, I'm really glad because you didn't buy my book. <laughs> so, you know, uh, there's no reason for you not to be empowered. And I'll kind of end on that, that, you know, it's empowerment. You know, it's being engaged. It's working with your doc, you know, and being like, you know, the docs like, you know, Dr. Meadows and, and the team at CHOP, you know, they're really proactive, you know. Okay, thank you so much.